My name is Dr. Dave Vaughn, and I'm broadcasting to you from the sunny Florida Keys, where it's very nice and warm, and we're in the subtropics here, and I work on coral reefs, which means I get the benefit of being able to work in and around the tropic and subtropical areas. I'm a marine biologist, and uh, because of that, I also get to scuba dive and snorkel. And I've been working on corals actually from the age of 13, when I got to do my first scientific expedition as a new scuba diver, to go on an expedition to the Virgin Islands to look for a location for the future West Indies lab. It was there that my job was to actually get this, use a hammer and a chisel and break off pieces of coral, put them in a jar of formaldehyde and send them back to the university so they could see what sort of coral species existed. Well, you wouldn't do that today. And in fact, I've spent the last 14 years developing technologies to replant coral back out on the reef. Not that I'm trying to make up for those few pieces of coral I collected for a scientific expedition, but because of all of us that have produced too much carbon dioxide, heated up the atmosphere, and made the temperatures for corals much hotter and much colder through climate change. They weren't made to do that. And so we found that we've lost a good portion of the world's corals, and I'm doing my best to take the ones that have survived today's conditions and try to, like a farmer would grow trees, grow more corals and plant them out on the reef. So I'm going to give you a PowerPoint slides of my title, why I'm going to plant a million corals. Well, hopefully you all can see that and see that this is a tank with baby corals, which we grow in order to make more of them and then plant them out. Most people have either snorkeled on a reef or possibly been able to see pictures of what a reef is supposed to look like. And it usually looks like thousands of pretty colors of organisms that look like they're from another planet. And they're beautiful, or they used to be. And many people know that our reefs are specific to provide us a lot of different types of fish. Even though reefs are less than 1% of the bottom of the ocean, they actually provide 25 to 40% of the world's fisheries. And they're a large economic boost to places where tourists want to come and see the beautiful reefs of the tropics and the islands they live around. But a lot of people don't realize one of the other important factors, and that is more real today than ever before. And that is they help protect our coastline. If it wasn't for our coral reefs offshore, most of the tropical places around the world people would not be able to live even close to the coastline. Recently, last year, in, in our hurricane season, we had one large storm, Irma, with 35-foot waves that would have gone over the tops of most people's houses. Luckily for us, we had a coral reef five miles offshore that broke most of those waves and we only sustained about four feet of water. 
what's happening to most of our reefs? If you look at the picture on the left, it's a beautiful reef. It is a reef that has some staghorn corals like you see looking like deer's antlers, some big elk horn coral that looks like elk or moose antlers, and a few other types of corals. This is the picture from the same location just 20 or 30 years later, hardly any corals left. And regretfully, this is the basis of most of our reefs, not just in Florida, but around the world. So what do you think we can do about it? Well, there's a number of things we can do. Some of the more important ones is we can try to protect more marine protected areas. For instance, we all grew up knowing that there were state parks, national parks, national wildlife refuges, but now we're only starting to make underwater marine sanctuaries. And the more we protect them, the better off we are. And of course, we want to improve water quality from pollution, but mainly it's from climatic conditions that we need to worry about by lowering our CO2 emissions. And that's just hoping that things get better. What we really need to do is restore the living corals. And you might ask me, well, why should we do that? If corals are dying, why should we make more corals and put them back out there to die? Well, not all corals are dying. There are some ones that are actually resistant to today's conditions. And as you see this picture of elk horn coral, but then during a bleaching event, one of the corals turns white. It was susceptible to today's conditions. And afterwards, only that one died. The other one stayed alive. If we can take some pieces from the live one and make more of those, we can plant the forest, underwater forest, just like you would trees, and plant them with corals that can survive today's conditions. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, there's a few ways, and if any of you saw the previous presentation, but my new best friend, Zach, you may have seen some of the startling things that they have brought to light, but also what we can do about it. We know we can grow trees in a, in a tree nursery. We can grow crops. We can even grow wetland plants and mangroves and dune grasses in nurseries and plant them back out. So why not coral nurseries, maybe underwater, like shown in this apparatus which we grow coral on and then plant it out in the wild. There's a number of types of corals out there. There's one that is very fast growing. I mentioned before the staghorn coral and it is a coral that branches and it grows actually very quickly. And it has evolved actually to be able to in storms, if any pieces of fragile pieces break, that if those pieces land in an area where they stick, they may grow and attach and grow up again. And so they have evolved for a way to actually uh, reproduce by pieces or fragments. And so all we have to do with those types is break them ourselves into fragments and let each fragment grow up to size and plant it again. Sounds simple. And it is. In fact, this is my friend Zach when he visited me to see our coral nursery. We call them trees, so it's very similar to forestry. And as you see, it's basically some PVC pipe which holds the pieces or fragments of coral. And we can actually tend them as, and harvest them as if you are walking through an orchard of apples and picking the apples. And it only takes about six months to a year from one small piece the size of your thumb or finger to grow up to many branches about the size of your hand and ready to plant. Well, here's a picture uh, from 2013 when we started doing this planting. And as you see in front of you, and I'll move the red pointer, 
these are some pieces of corals that we've attached to the bottom and they will on their own grow and reattach themselves. But what I wanna show you is the date up here, May 2013, when they were planted, about the size of a small hand. And now I'm gonna show you what it looked like in time. Here's June. You can see each of those have branched again. Here is October, five months later. They're already turning into what looks like a small bush. And here is seven months. And you can actually see some habitats being used by fish already taking place on this small area looking like a shrubbery. And within just one year, looking like it's formed from a twig to a large bush, making a functional habitat for others. And with good survival um, in this first year, and as much as three to five years later that we've documented that. But in Florida, we have only one or two branching corals. The rest are sometimes called the slow growing corals. They're the massive corals. They're the giant ones. They, you might have seen pictures of look like large boulders, some the size of cars. These massive corals, as we call it, actually build the reef, which is what we want to have take, to take place because we want to make sure that those storms keep hitting the reef first and protecting us along our coastline gives a lot of elevation of habitat for fish to breed in and do all of those functions of all the other thousands of animals that require our healthy reefs to be able to survive. But how are we gonna do that? Well, that's actually kind of hard. How do they even reproduce is a question most people have. Well, surprisingly so, we didn't even know they reproduce just like the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees until the 1980s. Now, some of you may not have been born yet in the 1980s, but I was actually 30 years old when we found out that these organisms once a year release gametes and is called a spawn. It occurs in the summer or the spring, depending on what part of the planet you live in. And it usually coincides with the lunar cycle. So for us in Florida, it's actually August. It's actually after the full moon in August. It's actually two days past the full moon in August. It's actually two hours after sunset, after two days, after the full moon in August. Now you can imagine that if somebody was diving at night throughout the year, they may not chance upon that one single time that these organisms release spawn and develop new, literally baby corals, unless you happen to be there at the time. And in fact, they're microscopic in size, way smaller than the head of a pin. It's called a coral larvae. And that larvae swims around on the surface of the water for about two days to as much as two weeks. It doesn't have a mouth, so it doesn't eat. Its parent cor corals actually give it enough lipid or fats so that it can survive swimming for that week period without having to eat. But because they have so much fat or lipid, they actually cannot sink and swim down in the water. They're stuck on top as if you had your life preserver on and you couldn't dive under the water because you were so buoyant. After they swim for two or three days to maybe five days, they use up enough of that fat. So they actually are not buoyant anymore. They can start swimming and they look for a new home. If they find a rock or an old coral skeleton or a hard bottom that they can attach to, they actually change from a larvae to the first baby coral. They're still very small. The picture on the left that you see these little tiny tentacles, this is a baby coral. 
it's still less than the size of a head of a pin. So we took this picture under a microscope, but it is one to three months old. After almost half a year, it'll grow up to the size of a head of a pin, maybe be seen by the naked eye, and you see it here on the right-hand picture. This is one polyp with its tentacles, with a mouth in the center, and these little colored dots is actually an algae that lives inside its tissue that can photosynthesize like a green plant can and give some of its energy to the coral. Our first chance of actually doing sexual reproduction of corals, the natural way they do it in spawning, allowed us to be able to make the first test tube babies in our laboratory about 10 to 14 years ago. I was so excited that we made the first 11 baby corals, except that by one year old, they were the size of a small coin by two years old, the size of a medium coin, and by three years old, only the size of a large coin, just starting to put up its aerial horns to even look like the Elkhorn coral that we know it. I was so disappointed how slow it was that I took it from the experimental aquarium where we had them on rungs of PVC pipe, testing the amount of light that they get. And I literally took it off of this area. And as you see the red dot, we had some of these up on pipes. And I took the ones that were growing too slow and I put them on the bottom like you see here. After a half a year, we clean our bottoms of the tanks and I took this one in order to remove it. It stuck and I didn't know why. Little did I know it had grown just like any good branching coral and attached itself to the bottom of the tank. And when I pulled on it and gave it a yank, I heard a crack and it had broken. I first thought that this would really hurt the coral. And I looked back in the bottom of the tank and I saw a number of little tiny polyps still waving their tentacles. And I thought to myself, they're not gonna make it. In fact, I think I said, they're probably toast. But you know what? That's not what happened. What happened is they started to grow very quickly. And in just a few weeks, they repaired themselves and grew back to the same size. And now that's known as my Eureka moment, the science behind the mistake. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Some of my best accomplishments were my biggest mistakes. And you can learn from mistakes by doing the science and testing it again to see if it really is different or was just a mistake at one in a thousand. And so was born what is now called microfragmentation, not just fragmentation of a big piece the size of your finger, but using now the same method but a specialized saw and breaking these corals, especially the big massive corals like the boulder corals and the brain corals into tiny pieces. Those tiny pieces are stimulated to grow real fast. Why, you may ask? I'm not entirely sure. But I do know this. We've all fallen, and our skin does not grow usually very fast at all. Except if you fall down and get a nice scrape on your knee or your elbow, what happens? If you were like me and learned how to ride a bike, and I always had a nice scab on my elbow or my knee, that same skin heals in just a couple of days or a few weeks. And yet, I think the coral is doing the same thing. By being broken into tiny pieces, the first thing it wants to do is heal itself up and grow back. And it does so at a rapid rate, just like our skin. And so we're using this method now as a method to grow coral in larger numbers and faster. We used to take fragments with a big saw like you would cut tile in, cut them to the size of a golf ball, wait two or three years, and make two more. We'd wait another two or three years and cut each one in half and make two more. 
Now we take a very specialized saw that is made actually for making jewelry from, from both gemstones, rocks, and coral. And we use it to cut the corals now into very tiny pieces, so tiny and about the size of a pencil eraser. So not only do we get many pieces, but they're all stimulated to grow back in months instead of years. This is a game changer for corals, and they sure need it. You can see by this graph from cutting large fragments over the years, we could just maybe in a year produce a few hundred. Now we cut a few hundred in an afternoon. And as you see by this graph has produced thousands and now tens of thousands. So this past year, we produced 25,000 corals and we planted over 10,000. This is an old slide. So now today we have actually outplanted over 50,000 corals and hope to do that again next year. So now you can see my goal of planting a million corals doesn't sound so crazy after all. Well, how are we doing this? We're doing it first in land nurseries, just as you would have a nursery table that might have four inch pots and you're growing geraniums or tomato plants. We use the same kind of tabletop, but we fill it with water and we grow the corals in the water where we can tend to them, check their growth and make more. This is a picture on the left of a tank which has over 1000 corals that were made in just one afternoon. The problem we were having is these corals are growing back so fast and we're making so many, we couldn't get tanks built fast enough. Usually we like to keep our, our corals about one or two inches apart, just like you and your brother and your sister in the back of the station wagon or a car will be able to say, I don't want to sit next to my brother or sister, so we're going to space ourselves out. Well, we used because we might fight. And so the corals too, if they're just a different coral, they may fight if they're too close. They think the other coral is trying to grow over the top of them. They may go to war. They may actually kill each other. So we usually kept them one or two inches apart and we would have years before they would grow together. But now we were running out of space. And like in the picture on the right, I'm gonna use my red pointer to show you an area where they not only are growing big and fast and close to each other, but if you see in here, you can't tell that they haven't meshed or fused into one piece. What's going on here? I thought they fought. And so we thought so too, except that all of these corals here came from one parental piece. And just as your skin, you, if you damaged it with being burnt, a doctor may be able to fuse some of your other back together. And so we're using this process we call fusion into doing something that we are now calling reskinning. We're actually like if you burnt your arm badly and a doctor would take some pieces of skin from your other arm and transplant it and graft it back onto the place it needed to grow. We're doing the same thing with all of these pieces of coral that all came from the same piece. We actually start with one coral head that may be dead and put on 20 pieces of it that came from the same parental piece. In a little bit, they start to grow towards each other and finally they grow and touch each other, but they don't fight. They actually fuse back together like a log. Shown in these four little pieces, our first fusion experiment showed that after just less than one year, these pieces of a brain coral all grew back together as one. This is something about the size of a large grapefruit and would have taken about 20 years to grow, but it, we fused it back together in one year. And so this is very interesting and something that we can do now out in the wild. This is a picture of a dead coral skeleton or dead coral head in which we have planted seven or eight pieces. 
you can see the glue or cement. And then on the left, a little bit, they're growing over the glue and the cement. And the picture on the right, they're actually growing towards each other, touching and fusing back together. This is a coral about the size of a large pizza pie. And as you can see, it kind of looks like we planted pepperonis on a pizza. But these pepperonis are live corals instead, and they actually grow together. And as, it, as if you planted living pepperoni on a pizza, and it grew over the top and engulfed and covered the entire pizza. This size pizza of a pizza would have taken 25 to 75 years to grow from one single coral baby. And we grew this in two to three years. Pretty amazing, but let's see how big we can go. This is a coral head that was probably two or 300 years old, about the size of a Volkswagen. We put 250 pieces on it, and right now it is coming back to life. Could you imagine a coral that was born back at the time when our country was being explored by Ponce de Leon and some of the other people, and now we're going to be bringing that back to life in just a couple of years? Well, how big can you go? It's hard to see this, but this is the one, uh, the size of, of basically a tractor trailer truck. And it is probably about 800 to 1,000 years old. But with 1,000 pieces of small corals, this will be brought back to life in just, again, two or three years. So this is a real game changer for corals. We can bring a century-year-old coral back to life. Not really, because we're actually putting new tissue on old dead skeleton. But that's pretty amazing, too. So now. Since that time, I told you we did our first 11 test tube babies from collecting of the gametes, the sexual cycle of corals, were getting better. And in 2013 and 14, we got a few dozen, 25. And now, like you see on the right, we get 1,000 to 4,000 new baby corals from successful survival of those little tiny larvae. Now this is important not because we can get a thousand, it's because we get a thousand new genetic diverse strains that may be able to handle the conditions of tomorrow. So we're actually testing those conditions of tomorrow. We actually have what I call a, an ocean simulator. It is basically tanks that we can adjust the temperature that we think might be around when you are growing up, 20 years, 50 years, even 100 years from now for your children. And we're actually changing the pH to see which conditions and which of these genetic strains may be winners in the future so that we can try to make more of those. Now, I've told you a bunch of crazy types of things from being able to get survival of sexual reproduction larvae that are surviving from a tiny ones, that we can actually get corals to grow real fast by cutting them into multiple little pieces. We can track the multiple little pieces and grow them together, and they will fuse and grow back into a big piece. But what I didn't tell you is these corals that we've made about the size of a large pizza pie, that's the size that most of them are really considered adults and mature. And for some reason, when they get to this size, even if it's only as a two-year-old, they think they're an adult and they start to act like an adult and they decide to have children. And so we found out that we can actually in just a couple of years produce a new strain up the size where it's reproductive again. Now I put this on a piece of paper as a cycle. that if we know there's a coral that may have some good attributes of surviving today, we cut it into little pieces. We make dozens of them. We grow those dozen pieces up to size so that they fuse together into a large coral head that becomes mature and starts to breed. We cross that good one with another one similar. We hopefully get a number of hundreds, if not thousands, of new baby corals from them. And we test them to see which of these 
are, is naturally resistant to some of the conditions of the future. That would be like what I sometimes say, we're looking for the one that wants to win the Summer Olympics. Now that may sound funny because there's no Olympics, but if we keep heating the water up of the ocean, it may take an Olympic style courage and athlete and attributions of a coral to be able to survive and grow in those conditions. We're trying to find which those are, just like you would try to find which tree would be good if there's a uh, disease for certain types of trees or which tomato would grow fast even if it was in the in a drought condition or which racehorse in the rain would even still win the race we've done that with all the other organisms we're not trying to do genetic modification we're just trying to select the ones faster than time would allow because we don't have time on our side and so as a summary, before this time, we never knew we could actually grow corals at scale in large numbers. We know now we can plant a million corals, my goal, for less than $10 a coral. How can we do that? Well, let's do the quick math. Right now in one of those tanks I showed you, let's pretend we had 400 Elkhorn corals. The Elkhorn corals we usually can cut into 50 tiny pieces, little as one, two, or three polyps in a piece. So if we took 400 corals and we cut them into 50, we would get, you can say it, 20,000 corals. That's a lot. But in six months, they're ready to cut again. So if we took 20,000 corals, and in six months, we cut each one into 50, what would we have? You can say it. Let me hear you shout it out. One million corals in one year. That's just next year. So in your generation, we may be able to produce millions of corals, just like people are planting billions of trees back in the rainforest to try to gain our forest back. We could take staghorn coral and elkhorn coral off the endangered species list because with just one or two million corals. And we could do that in our lifetime. Could you imagine we lost 40% of most of the corals, and in some cases it's more, that in just the next few years we could replant them all with corals that could survive tomorrow's conditions? Well, some places are doing it. This is a project I work and help with in in Belize called Fragments of Hope. It's a nice name and it does give us hope. And we use fragments to go from this picture in the upper left, a coral reef destroyed by hurricanes. So we're getting more hurricanes now because of climate change as well. And this is me diving in it just a few years later. Look how thick and luxurious these staghorn and elkhorn corals are. This is the same picture from the one on the left. So now, instead of showing you a picture of what it used to look like beautiful and what it is today and not looking so good, I'm going to start showing you pictures of places that look bad now, but can look like this with your help. I want to show you one more. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually training and demonstrating this technology to both students and practitioners and people that didn't think it was possible before. In fact, people who don't see these corals firsthand and personal don't believe that it actually is being done. But once you see it, it's believing. And so I want to show you one more area. Cancun in Mexico, the Mexican Riviera, was also hurt by Hurricane Wilma uh, back in 2005. And this is what happened to the reef. The reef that was beautiful, like in the picture before, look like this destruction i want to show you another picture so you don't think it was just one location the entire reef the size of two football fields was flattened into rubble now after planting in the last three five and eight years with just less than ten thousand corals planted this is what it looks like today 
So we can take something that looks like a, a mine that had a rubble zone or a, almost like a desert and turn it into a luxuriant looking reef again. And so one of the things that I like to tell people is we may have a few, only a few dozen corals, but if we lose our corals, we lose 2,000 species of fish and invertebrates. If we lose our corals, we lose 2,000 species of fish and invertebrates that we love. And so we must keep our corals, not just for coral sake, but for all the other organisms they provide. And I'm gonna leave with this picture up, showing what there is hope, and that you as, as students could like do what I did. When I started growing up, we first started finding out that there, we wanted to have national parks and state parks and redo the forests and have lots more deer and, and squirrels and animals. And so I wanted to be a park ranger. Now we're getting underwater parks. We're getting underwater protected areas, national marine sanctuaries underwater. And now we have the tools to replant corals like we had the plant chance of replanting trees in an upland forest. So you could be literally an underwater park ranger or an underwater forestry, a coral restoration manager maybe in the future and have your part so that your children also can see the world like I saw it years ago. And with that, I'll, I'll open for questions if there are questions out there. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm getting questions or I have to click on it. Oh, I think I'm getting some typing taking place. Okay, well, I'm not sure how I listen to these typed questions. There's 17 people online, and I see at least half of them typing. But I don't seem to see the question. Uh, Dr. Vaughn, do you want me to read the questions for you? Sure, unless there's something I should be pushing to see them. Um, well, there should be a text box underneath the um, video feed, and it has all the questions in there. I don't see my text box. That's all right. I can just read it. Okay. Them. Um, Go ahead. Uh, somebody wants to know if humans are taking away coral food. If humans are taking away what? Coral food. Coral food. No, that's a good question though. If you were a whale or if you were another fish and people were taking out the shrimp or the krill, you would be taking away the food for whales and other organisms. But the corals actually utilize two ways of feeding. One is by way of just utilizing those beautiful colors, which is a plant pigment that's inside them. And just like a plant utilizing the sun for photosynthesis, they're able to produce some food themselves just from sunlight alone. But in addition, most of them use those small tentacles to capture zooplankton, very small microscopic animals in the water column, and they eat them. So far, mankind has not fished or farmed or harvested zooplankton. What they have uh, 
actually pulled out is krill, which looks like a smaller baby shrimp, something much bigger than what most of the corals can eat. So, so far we're lucky. Man is not competing with the food for the corals. But as times could get tougher, you never know what new technologies people might have for gaining protein and food to keep them alive. I'd like to add that um, we have getting close to 8 billion people on this planet. And almost 1 billion of those people on this planet get their, not livelihood, but get their daily food substance from going out on the reef and taking uh, fish and lobsters and so on. So the corals wouldn't be eating that, but they are providing the habitat that allows those to be. So if we lose our corals, we will actually have to feed another 1 billion people somehow around the world. Uh, thank you, good question. I think I have time for a few more. Uh, how did you get interested in studying corals? Oh, that's a great question. And I love answering this because unlike many people, if your grandparents ask you, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And a lot of you may not really know yet. For most people, they don't learn that until they do grow up. But I guess I was a little different. At 11 years old, I read the book, The Silent World by Jacques Cousteau. And then I grew up watching on Sunday nights, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, videos, pictures in colors of what was underneath our oceans. And I fell in love with wanting to be a marine biologist. Now, most people, when they see somebody that they are esteemed like Jacques Cousteau or a top NFL football player or a basketball player or an astronaut, they want to be just like that person. And I pictured myself being a marine biologist. And by 13 years old, I wanted to be a diver at the age when most people did not learn how to scuba dive. And in fact, my parents thought that I, it would just be a passing phase and just let him alone and he'll forget about that and do something else until the day they came down our basement. And with my chemistry set and my lead cowboy, Indian and, and soldier model figurines, back then we didn't have them in plastic. And I was melting them down to make weights for scuba diving. And they figured that I, it wasn't just a passing phase. And so when many people were actually writing book reports about World War II fighters, NFL players, I was writing books, reports about Jacques Cousteau and the other people that were exploring this wonderful undersea world. And so I wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grow up exactly. So I moved from working with sea grasses, the underwater meadows, to clams, to oysters, to shrimp to fish, to marine ornamental fish, that is the clownfish for the aquarium trade, so they didn't have to take Nemo from off of the reef. And I got visited by the two grandchildren of Jacques Cousteau. And they loved what I was doing in growing clams with fishermen and sustainable ways to aquaculture with, without destroying the environment. And they loved what I was doing in growing clownfish so they didn't have to take them off the reef. But I also started growing some corals so that people who wanted to have a reef tank in their aquarium did not have to take the corals from the natural reef. And when young Philippe Cousteau looked at me and said, Dave, what are you doing? I said, what's the matter? He said, you don't get it, do you? I said, what's the problem? He said, if you can do this for the aquarium trade, you could do this for the reef. And so Philippe Cousteau and I started a new international coral restoration initiative over 20 years ago. And it's been 20 years in the making. I still work with Philippe and we are both trying to do good work 
He's doing work with kids around the, the world in called Earth Echo International. And I'm doing work with plant a million corals. And both of those are a darn good start. So if you're growing up and you have some ideas what you'd like to be, just try them out. If you think you like marine biology, ask your teacher if you could do a special project with a marine tank. If you think you like agriculture, see if you can do something growing a plant. If you think you want to be in medicine or nursing or something like that, ask your teacher if there's a special project you can read up on or go to a summer camp and learn more because it's all of those special things that make the difference of you getting a job or you looking like all the rest of your friends who have A's and B's. Now, don't get me wrong, everybody needs A's and B's, but if you all get A's and B's and one of you have had a dozen different experiences, camps, special projects with your teacher, that makes the difference to me to wanna hire you or give you a chance to be an intern. So I would suggest that by doing all of those question things of learning more, you'll actually know if you like it or not. And even if you decided the wrong thing, at least you know that. So when you do grow up, you'll be doing what you like to do and get paid for it. I think I still have time for questions. So if you can give me another one. How long would it take to rebuild a broken coral? Okay, that's a great question. And it really depends on the size of the coral and really how many pieces you want, want to put into it. If you recall, I was talking about one to two years and that's one to two years, whether you're taking a coral that's the size of a quarter and bringing it back to that size with 20 little pieces, or it's the same two years if you take those 20 little pieces that have grown up to a quarter and put them all on a coral head the size of a pizza pie and it take two years and you're producing a 25 or 50 year old coral. Or if you take 200 pieces and put it on a coral head the size of a small car and bring it back to life still in two years, but it takes 200 pieces to do that. So really in just a couple of years, you could reform new live tissue, very similar to if you had wanted to put a new grass lawn in your house and you didn't want to buy full amount of sod, but you wanted to plant seeds or you wanted to put plugs every six inches or every foot and wait a year till it all grew together and formed a, a new lawn in just one to two years. So we can do something pretty quickly. We just need the, the support, the time, the energy, and the money to be able to grow these corals, plant them out, just like we do now with growing trees in nurseries, growing dune grasses and replanting dunes after a storm, because they're very similar. They stabilize the ocean bottom and they break those waves before they get to our homes. How many different kind of coral reefs exist? Oh, that's, that's a good question. You know, we, we have a number of oceans and each of the oceans has a different diversity or types of corals. For instance, in Florida, just off the Atlantic Ocean in the Caribbean Sea, we have about 30 species of corals, but only two of them are those branching corals I talked about, the Elkhorn and the Staghorn corals. And you go to the Pacific Ocean and there's 200 species of branching corals and 250 species of, of the mast of corals. And so there are different types of species, just like if you went to Africa, you would see different grasses and different trees than if you were in the Midwest. And so different parts of the world uh, will have different types of corals and different types of reefs. There are a few kinds of reefs that they actually form. One is in a circle and it's called an atoll. And that grows on the fringe of an island, let's say a volcano that may be coming up or going down. And so that outer area starts to grow just those few feet offshore like they need to grow. Then what we have what's called barrier reefs. These are reefs that parallel our coastline. 
And they, for instance, like you've heard of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, it may be 12 to 25 miles off the shore, but it goes along that length and protects the big waves from coming ashore. Then we have small pieces like little islands, and it's called patch reefs. And these form little clumps, just like you would have oasis in a desert. And so we have patch reefs, barrier reefs, atolls, and sometimes we have some fringing reefs that are around an island or close to the shore. So they all form a different pattern because of the circumstances of where they are and the species that are, they are made up of. Have you ever discovered a new coral? What was the first part about a new coral? Have I discovered a new coral? Have you ever discovered a new coral? Uh, well, remember, we didn't even really understand what corals were until the past few decades. We didn't know they reproduced. Could you imagine if we didn't know that how horses or birds or bees or flowers or the trees actually reproduced? Uh, until just a few years ago. And so there are many more new species of corals, especially in the Pacific Ocean, where they have hundreds of species. But we only have a few dozen species here in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. And I'm sure there's going to be a few more of them uh, discovered. And so other people may discover more. I predict that we're really finding now that we're exploring the deeper parts of the ocean, some areas deep that may have cold water deep corals. And there may be some new species people will be able to discover and name. I have not uh, discovered a new coral, only a new way to make all the corals grow faster. And it works for all of them. All 28 species of corals here in the Caribbean, when cut into small micro fragments, will grow faster and produce more. And so the good news is we've seen this works in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. So there is hope. And I want everybody to know that there is not only hope, but there's a technology we can all use to basically sustainable, sustainably keep ourselves alive and healthy on this planet. But one of the things we have to stop doing is take in the few billion years of fixed carbon by made during the times as far back as the dinosaurs that is stored as coal and oil and gas and decide that in our generation we want to burn all of those up that took billions of years to form into just a couple of years and produce all that carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. I know there are people that don't believe that it's taking place, but that's because carbon dioxide is clear. It's invisible and it doesn't even smell or taste. Could you imagine if CO2 were orange and smelled like rotten eggs that we couldn't see outside because there was so much CO2? We would then know that it is a problem and we should change it. And so, Regretfully, just because it is invisible doesn't mean it's not there. Just because we can see with instruments that it's there, it's the same as being able to see that a thermometer reads a temperature that's high or that's low. It's there even if we can't see it. So the data is all there. 98% of all scientists say it's truth. We're killing ourselves by taking most of our natural resources and burning them up too quickly. You can all do something to help. If you get a car, I used to have a car, a truck that got only 15 miles per gallon. Now I've got a hybrid that gets 35 miles per gallon. So I'm using just one third of what I did before, but I'm going the same places. So I smile every time that I pass by it a gas station and don't have to get more gasoline and burn it up. I smile every time I turn off a light in a room that as I'm exiting and there's no one in it. I smile as I change the thermostat to get a little bit more efficiency, put on a sweater in the winter, uh, put on shorts and a t-shirt in the summer, and not have to burn more CO2 to get electricity to run air conditioners and heaters 
when we don't have to. You've all probably heard lately that we are really the plastic generation and a lot of our plastics are ending up in our oceans. And so we need to fix that. But just picking up one aluminum can and recycling it or picking up one plastic straw is not going to change it. We have to do that, but we all have to do more. And it's all of us. So if we can all get together, live better on this planet, use less resources, that all of the number of people can still enjoy living on this planet, but let's not kill this planet for our next generations. We have the chance to do this right. There is no plan B for the planet Earth. This is what is the Garden of Eden that God has given us. Let's keep it green and let's keep it blue. Um, uh, is there a point where coral can't regrow? There may be a point where coral can't regrow if it gets way too hot. So you've all heard about you know, the climate change that we're keeping the average of Earth's temperature to no more than two degrees higher than it is just 20 or 30 years ago. Two degrees does not sound bad because it's hard to tell two degrees difference. But what they mean of that is two degrees average difference. It may end up being 10 degrees colder in winter like we had this year, but it might be 12 degrees hotter all summer. If it's 10 degrees colder in the winter and 12 degrees hotter in the summer, then it ends up only being a two degree difference in the average year, but it's two degrees in a lot of directions and two degrees is the average. So very, very hot temperatures, it may not be good for corals. We know that in the Red Sea, where corals have evolved to be heated up for the past few thousand years, some of those corals have slowly evolved to be resistant. Our problem is we've just done it here in the rest of the world in just 30 to 100 years. And so if we keep growing these temperature higher and higher, it is thought that the difference between what it was 100 years ago to now is two degrees hotter. If we make it four or five degrees hotter, they're probably will be not much we can do for the corals to grow. We're finishing up at the top of the hour. If you would like to answer a couple more questions, that'd be great. Okay, I want to thank you all for listening over this hour. And I want to leave you with two things. One is that uh, um, climate change is real and we need to change it. But second is we can do it. We all learned when I grew up that we had acid rain, and yet we solved acid rain. We learned we were getting a hole in the ozone layer. It sounded too big to solve, but we're solving it. Climate change is solvable. It's up to us. And we can save our corals in the meantime. And there is hope. So we can do this. And thank you all for having me here. And join me in planting a million corals. You can go to my website at plantamillioncorals.com with hyphens in between and see what me and my family is doing to try to grow more corals. Thank you very much. And keep the world safe, green and blue. Thank you. Great. sure how to get out of here.
Uh, Dr. Vaughn, if you're trying to exit, there should be a little X at the top of the right oh, of the screen. It. The top of the right of the uh, screen. Thank you very much. And uh, you should be good. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you so All much. All right. Thanks for helping. We'll talk to you next year.